nice turnout and um, pleasure to be able to uh, be on another webinar. I've done a few with DAI and it, it's always a lot of fun. Um, this uh, should be interesting. Tomorrow, as I mentioned, is our American Thanksgiving, which is when we're supposed to um, give thanks for that time 400 years ago when uh, we were welcomed as refugees. So that's kind of ironic in this day and age, but um, uh, I'm going to skip politics and get on to the talk, which may be political enough all by itself. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about this framework. And what I'd like to do, there, there have been a few people out there, including at least Kate on this call, who have been challenging this mindset. And um, I'd like to share some thoughts about that um, and not spend the whole time talking. I really want to uh, leave plenty of time for discussion uh, for a couple of reasons. I want to hear different perspectives about this, but also um, uh, I have my own theories about what I think is going on rather than purely symptoms of brain disease. But there are people uh, on this call who are living with a diagnosis of dementia, and, and you may have other ideas about what are primary symptoms and what aren't. So I would love to get your perspectives because anytime I can learn and refine my ideas, that's always uh, very helpful for me. So um, I am going to start uh, by just once again explaining if you um, have not heard the phrase that BPSD is a common way to refer to the words and actions of people living with dementia and what BPSD stands for um, hang on, let me get, is um, behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, although I might uh, somewhat cheekily suggest that it could also stand for biomedical paradigms uh, support drugging. So uh, let's uh, explore that just a little bit. Um, are these really symptoms of dementia? I want to show you a, an ad for the antipsychotic drug, the old drug Thorazine. This came out about a half century ago in the U.S., and there's that very scary looking gentleman on the picture. And if you can't read the red writing, it says tyrant in the house, Thorazine can control the agitated belligerent senile. Um, so uh, my question is how much have things really changed since then? Um, there are a couple of things I can tell you have definitely changed. We don't really use Thorazine anymore. It's an old drug that causes a lot of sedation and other uh, difficulties. And uh, we don't tend to call people senile anymore. But beyond that, I'm not sure that we've made a lot of progress in 50 years. We still talk about people being agitated. We still talk about people being belligerent. And we still uh, see them as the problem. And we see our job as controlling these so-called challenging behaviors. So um, while we have changed some of the words, the mindset maybe has not shifted as much as I think it should. I'm going to have to figure out how to make this slide go, I guess, just by clicking on the mouse. Okay, so what are my problems with this? Well, BPSD, once again, suggests that what we're seeing are symptoms of dementia. If you say that people's words and actions are symptoms of brain disease, then you're missing a lot of other factors. They may be environmental factors, they may be relational factors, they may be historical factors. It could be affecting somebody's well-being. We tend to pathologize normal expressions and uh, uh, you know, Kate talks about this a lot, I know. I, I believe personally that we, that we hold people living with dementia to a higher standard emotionally than we do ourselves. Uh, Kate will talk about how most of uh, people without the diagnosis can go for a walk or get a Fitbit into our steps or just get bored and leave, but a person with dementia becomes a wanderer or an exit seeker. And uh, we can go down through a lot of things and talk about the way we take uh, certain expressions or certain emotions that we feel are normal for human beings, but they become some sort of a problem behavior when we're talking about a person who's been labeled with the diagnosis of dementia. Um, sometimes when I do seminars, often I will I will give people a little bit of a challenge. It's I don't ever follow through, but I'll I'll be talking to a group of people, mainly uh, professionals or family members who do not live with the diagnosis, and I'll say, how about if we do a little uh, fun exercise now? I'm going to pair you up with the person who's sitting next to you, and the two of you are going to go away to a shower room, and your partner is going to strip you naked and give you a shower. How many people are ready to go do that? And um, as you can imagine, you get everything from horrified looks to nervous laughter from the audience, but nobody's really anxious to go do that. And so I remind people, if you find this difficult, do you have a BPSD or is it hard to be strip naked and maybe uh, given fairly personal care by someone whom you may or may not know. It even goes beyond the idea of whether people are strangers or not because um, I did a presentation once with a woman who's a, a design expert who um, was 
uh, wanted to experience what it was like getting a shower, but was even too nervous about having a professional uh, staff member do it. So she asked her husband to give her a shower at home. And even with the person she knew and loved and maybe trusted the most, she found this an extremely challenging experience to be stripped naked and to have somebody else controlling this, this task uh, instead of her doing it. I think we tend to use systems of categorization that don't make a lot of sense to me. I believe that actually this framework has been the biggest barrier to removing inappropriate drugs. Because if you think about it, if you really believe that these things are caused by brain disease, of course you're gonna use a pill because that's how you treat diseases. Um, it doesn't explain why in the US there are 150 or 160 different residential care homes that at any given time use zero antipsychotics and hundreds more that may use 3% or less. Um, and I think it misapplies labels. And I was very happy last week in Alabama to have met with a very prominent behavior neurologist, Dr. David Geldmacher, uh, very nice guy, extremely bright, um, and comes from the behavioral neurology framework, but even he was able to say quite confidently to me what I believed, and that is that these things that we label psychosis and people with dementia really are not the same as what's happening in the brain of a person with schizophrenia. It's chemically different, and the idea of giving a drug that blocks dopamine really never made any sense. So even if you believe people are having delusions or hallucinations, the pill is not the answer when there's something different going on chemically. So uh, I, I wanna make a correction here. And, and I'd like to just talk about a couple of subtle things today. This is really the thrust of my talk, is these two subtle mind shifts. And um, these are really important to me. They're mild and you might think that they're just nuanced and that we're just talking semantics, but I think they're really important. I think that even making slight changes in our thinking can lead to huge differences in how we see people and how we support them. And uh, the way I've been thinking about it recently is if you were building a tall building, maybe a skyscraper, you know, on that first floor, you've got to get those walls absolutely vertical. And if they're only off by one or two degrees, it may not seem like much, but when you pile story upon story upon story, you get up to maybe the 20th or 30th floor, that little difference in a plumb line is going to be huge. The building might even be falling over at that point because that gets magnified. And so I'm gonna make the argument that even a slight change in how we look at this can lead to very drastic differences in outcomes for people living with the symptoms of dementia. And I'll give an example of two things happening in the US that show at the end of the road how you can take yourself to extremely different places. Um, a lot of people will criticize those of us who don't like the framework and say that we're just seeing dementia as a social construct, that there is real brain disease and we're not willing to admit that. Um, and I don't think that the people I know feel that way. I certainly don't feel that way. I believe that dementia you know, represents real brain disease or real injury to the brain. Um, and, but, I, but the question is, is that brain damage the root cause of the person's words or actions? I think that a lot of things that are root causes are the same things that would stress anybody, such as the examples I gave. Um, but dementia does cause some real symptoms, such as difficulties maybe verbalizing feelings, needs, preferences, maybe difficulty remembering information that helps people to feel secure or in control, and possibly coping with stressors in the environment. So uh, going back to the example of someone giving someone a shower, if, uh, if I paired up two people without dementia and had them go through the exercise, and if one person put the other under the shower and turned on the water, and if the water were too cold, a person without significant uh, cognitive change might say, hey, the water's too cold, or she might even reach over and adjust the temperature to her own liking. A person living with advanced disability from dementia might not be able to verbalize that, and they might shout or scream. They might actually strike out at the person assisting with the shower. So the dementia was a modulator of their response. It affected how they responded to the situation, absolutely. But was the dementia the root cause? Well, the root cause was the cold shower. And if you believe that what the person did was a symptom of dementia, then you might uh, give them a drug like an antipsychotic. You might, God forbid, get an extra person in there to hold them while you perform the shower and never turn the water up. And so the person has to suffer through that every day because we didn't look deeper than brain disease. What I gave you is an extremely simplistic situation. 
but I think we can look at more complex situations of distress or of different expressions with people with dementia, and we can apply the same logic. And I think we can see that actually we can apply this to many, if not most situations where we are using uh, drugs maybe to no avail. So when I hear people's words or see their actions, if it's not primarily brain disease, what do I think is going on? Well, I think there are several possible categories I've put people in, none of which, as you can see, will ever be helped by a pill. Um, one of the biggest ones I see is that people who are distressed often have unmet needs or maybe challenges to their well-being. I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail uh, shortly. They may have sensory challenges, and thanks to people uh, like Agnes Houston, who spent her Churchill Fellowship talking about the changes in the five senses that occur with aging and occur with dementia, many of us have had a chance to learn about how sometimes our five senses change, and we have to understand how the water from a shower might feel differently on your skin, or how you might smell an abnormal smell that smells like smoke, which could cause distress, or other changes in how we sense the world around us. Um, we may have new communication pathways. If we can't find the words or the memories to express things, we might express ourselves more through our more durable emotional memories. Uh, we might express with feelings or we might express with symbolic language. Or we might actually express through our body language when we cannot uh, express it through words. Sometimes it's just an expression of, of agency, just an attempt to try to control an environment that may be increasingly out of our control. And I remember a, 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 um, a paper I read from Quebec where they talked about people calling out in residential care homes and how that might be an expression of agency among people with more advanced disability. It may be just a different way of interpreting the world and problem solving. My friend, uh, gerontologist Sonia Barzin says, people with dementia are not problem makers, they're actually problem solvers. Uh, people are using their brain in spite of the lost connections or difficulties accessing information to figure out the world as best they can. It may not make sense to an observer, but it actually makes perfect sense when you look uh, through the mindset of the person living with the diagnosis. It could be a response to a physical aspect of the environment or some sort of a relationship or relational aspect of the environment. What's happening in uh, with your the, uh, the dynamic between you and the people around you or people who are assisting you that could cause you to be distressed. And it could be, as we said, a normal reaction. It could be a reaction to um, improper assistance with care or being locked up in an environment, which I know would, would drive me up the wall even living without dementia at this point in time. So what I ask people who are providing care and support to do is to look at the person's expressions differently than maybe we were taught. The way we were taught and the way you read in the media and the journal articles is that over 90% of people living with dementia will experience a BPSD during the course of their illness. Now, if this is what we believe and we're looking at someone whose distress we're trying to figure out, um, what does that tell you about where the problem lies, what the cause might be, and um, how useful a pill might be? Instead, what if we were looking at that exact same person, but instead we were taught that over 90% of people living with dementia will find themselves in a situation in which their well-being is not adequately supported? Well, now, where do you think the problem lies? And how useful does a medication look? So same person, different way of looking at it. A subtle shift. The dementia is real, but let's look beyond it for the root cause and just see it as a modulator of distress or attempts to communicate instead of the actual deepest foundational cause. So let's take a musical interlude. I'm hoping, since I'm using my computer speakers, that if I play this, you'll all hear it. Kate, give me a shout if it doesn't work. Um, Kate asked me to provide uh, a little video for World Rocks Against Dementia Day uh, in 2019. And uh, so this idea came to me when I was thinking of an old folk song. And I got together with my colleague, up at Schlegel Villages in Canada, Heather Luth. And uh, we're just gonna give you a little bit of humor to um, take us to the next section. Hi everybody, this is Al Power with my colleague Heather Luth. We're at Schlegel Villages in Ontario, Canada. This year for WRAD 19, we decided to bring you the great old German folk song, The Happy Wanderer, which is sung by millions of people in many different languages. But we've decided to try to reimagine what would happen 
if the song were sung by a person living with a diagnosis of dementia and observed by maybe a medically oriented person who saw their words and actions as behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. So I'm going to sing the actual lyrics to a couple verses and Heather is going to observe me and tell me what she thinks about my words through that lens. I love to go a wandering along the mountain track. And as I go, I love to sing my knapsack on my back. Veldery, Veldera, Veldery, Veldera, ha 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 ha. Veldery, Veldera, my knapsack on my back. <clears throat> I love to wander by the stream that sparkles in the sun. So joyously it calls to me, come join my happy song. Veldery, Veldera, Veldery. Come join my happy song. We would all clap if we could, Al. <laughs> that is available on YouTube, I believe, on the DAI channel. So if you want to show it to a friend, it's up there. So yeah, thanks. It, it was a lot of fun. And, and it just shows how, how art art and metaphor get lost when you start viewing people in such uh, literal terms and, and judging people that way. Um, what I have tried to do over the years in, in helping myself to see dementia differently is uh, to listen to the people I consider the true experts. Many of you are on this call right now. Uh, I have to stop making these slides because I've met more people than I can possibly depict on the slide and I'm leaving people out. Um, so we'll, we may have to stop doing this, but certainly Kate and Diana and Helga are all on here. And there may have been some other people that logged on that I didn't see John's on here too, I believe. Um, and, um, and all but two of these people are still living and still educating me. Uh, the embarrassing thing as a longtime doctor is that I had teachers teaching me about dementia for years that I wasn't paying enough attention to. So fortunately, I wised up in my old age and I'm starting to listen a lot more. But I realized that the person's experience is very important. We can't just look at, at, text, at plaques and tangles and Lewy bodies and know what an individual with all of their uh, life experiences and background and, and personalities are truly experiencing in the way of those brain changes. Um, so to just sort of summarize what I have been doing to try to see dementia differently, um, my approach rests on three pillars. The first one is to define dementia not narrowly just as brain disease, but through shifting experience. I'll get to that in a moment. To um, look for a more proactive primary goal, which is to try to support well-being in several different aspects for each individual. And the third is transforming the living or care environment to support the first two, because neither a beautiful holistic mindset or a great uh, plan will work if our approach to care and our systems of care don't shift to uh, enable those different ways of seeing and acting. So the first pillar, uh, the new definition, uh, this is the one thing I guess I haven't changed in the last 15 years since I started working on this, and that was to redefine dementia simply as a shift in the way a person experiences the world around her or him. Um, and I think you'll agree that's true. It's obviously too fuzzy to help design a new pill. But I think for most of us who are trying to support people, just saying, how is this person's perception, their experience of the world different from the way it used to be? How can I understand that? How can I find accommodations to help me to support that person to live as well as possible? So this road led me down a lot of different places than where I was going. The verse is when you think about the person's changing experience, you th and think about accommodations, you start seeing dementia through the lens of disability. And certainly people like uh, Kate talk about this a lot. 
Um, it is um, something I first heard the first time I got to meet uh, the late Dr. Richard Taylor. Uh, one of the things he said in his keynote, which struck me, was I'm not dying of a fatal disease. I'm living with a chronic disability. And that shifted two things, shifted the focus from dying to living and shifted the focus from fatal disease to chronic disability. Um, and that helped me to see people through the eyes of people that may have other types of disabilities. And I began thinking about a person maybe who's in a wheelchair, who's had an injury and can no longer walk. Um, and how we provide accommodations such as wheelchair ramps for people that are confined to wheelchairs and can't stand and walk anymore. And I was thinking how funny it would be if we asked a person in a wheelchair to walk up the steps because that's what we do. And then if they couldn't do it and got angry, diagnosing a behavior problem and giving them an antipsychotic drug. It sounds ridiculous, but really that's what we do for people living with dementia. We expect them, uh, whether they're living at home or, or in long-term care, residential care, to um, see the world the way we do, to follow our rhythms, our schedules, our staffing needs. And if they can't, then we give them these powerful medications. Um, so what are the cognitive ramps we can be giving to help people whose brains are changing to continue to succeed in a world that doesn't necessarily uh, keep pace with the way they're seeing it? An interesting thing that happened that I just discovered in recent years um, when I started looking at dementia this way is it did something kind of subversive. And I think part of the reason that we doctors over-medicate people with dementia is because it's not necessarily only our paradigm. It's the paradigm of those care partners who may be calling us up on the phone. And that could be professional staff, say in a, in a residential care or a hospital or home care, or it could be family members who call us up you know, and say, so-and-so is just their behaviors out of control. We need something. And uh, you know, when you're a doctor, what you do that's different is you prescribe drugs. So if you call a doctor, you're probably gonna get a drug because we assume that's the reason they're calling us. Uh, as I've heard people say, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And um, so what do we do, for instance, in residential care, if we have somebody that we can't figure out how to support, they're very distressed, we're finding it very challenging. If we call a specialist, like a neurologist or a psychiatrist, of course, they're going to think, in terms of medications because that's their focus on brain disease, that narrow focus. Um, and dementia, let's face it, it's complex and there's probably nothing in the universe more complicated than the human brain. Uh, so when we define dementia narrowly by all those complex changes in this incredibly complex structure, then the experts, of course, are the neurologists, the psychiatrists, the geriatricians. And so when someone is having trouble, maybe they're resisting a bath or maybe they're trying to leave a locked living area. If we call up somebody who sees the world through all that complex brain disease, those experts are going to prescribe medications. But if we define dementia as a shift in the way a person experiences the world, then who become the experts? Well, the person with the changing brain certainly is the expert, but also secondarily, the people who are closest to that person, who may be professional or family supportive partners and all of a sudden they become the experts because we're not looking at plaques and tangles, we're looking at how the person's experience is changing. And so it flips that whole hierarchy of expertise and puts the specialists, they still have a role, but when it comes to daily life and daily care, we're not deferring to neurologists and psychiatrists. We're talking to people and saying, how can we support this person to live better? So it's kind of a subversive way of looking at it, but I think it gives us better results in most cases. Second pillar is to not just try to mitigate disease, but to try to enhance well-being. I can't tell you what well-being is for each of you, but there are some very good frameworks out there. The one that many of you know I've glommed onto for my uh, writing and my seminars is one that uh, some specialists came up with on an Eden Alternative grant, which talked about seven areas of human need that maybe we don't measure very well in residential care. We have quality indicators around falls and infections and catheters and restraints and things like that, and they're very important. But in teaching how to support people in residential care or even at home, we don't talk about these other areas that we all need. Uh, Eden identifies them as identity, connectedness, security, autonomy, meaning, growth, and joy. There are other frameworks that are equally good that you may like better. Uh, it's not these seven words that are magical. It's the idea that we're focusing on supporting these in a proactive, strength-based way and not just seeing things through the lens of disease all the 
times. There are advantages of focusing on well-being and not just disease. This leads to proactive uh, interventions, not reactive. It leads to focusing on strengths and not weaknesses. It's what we might call upstream interventions instead of downstream. In Australia, they might say top of the cliff instead of bottom of the cliff. Uh, instead of picking up the body at the bottom of the cliff, let's see if we can figure out how to keep them from falling off the top in the first place. Um, and the third pillar is transforming our care systems. It might be the physical environment. It might be our personal mindset about things like BPSD. And it might also be the systems of care that may put you in places that are hard for a person with a changing brain uh, to adapt. So this leads to another challenge, and this is the other subtle change I'd like to throw at you, and that is why non-pharmacological interventions don't work. Why would the guy who wrote Dementia Beyond Drugs say that? Well, it's not that it's not good to stay away from pills, but we're still looking at them with that narrow biomedical view. So when we say, well, let's try, you know, let's try aromatherapy, let's try a massage, let's try music and memory, these are all good things for many people in many circumstances, but to just apply them blindly or to study them as a, quote, intervention across a number of people doesn't really individualize care around people's needs. It's reactive, not proactive. We say, okay, when the person gets distressed, let's take them to the room and give them a hand massage. And that can be very calming for the moment. But if the root cause is in those domains of well-being, if the root cause is that I don't have any choice or control in my environment, I don't have meaningful re relationships, or I don't have purposeful engagement, well, what good is a hand massage? It might make you feel good for the moment, but it's not going to solve your issues. Um, it may not have meaning for the person. It's not tied into that well-being um, framework. And it's often treated like doses of pills. We tend to give these interventions in two ways, either a fixed dose like a pill once a day. So uh, we'll have that gentleman full washcloths once a day, whether that really meets his needs or not. Or we give it PRN as needed. So when someone so -and -so gets upset, we'll sit down with her and give her a hand massage. Once again, it could be calming for the moment. But if that's not the root cause, it's just a Band-Aid, just like a pill is a Band-Aid. Uh, if anybody on this call has worked around long-term care staff, you've probably heard many, many times, more times than I can count. You know, Mrs. Johnson is very calm when I sit with her and talk to her, but when I leave, she gets upset again, and I can't give her one-to-one -one care all day. That's a very common complaint, and that's because we're trying to put Band-Aids on deeper needs that lie further below. So if we just superimpose these interventions on the usual care environment, we're not getting to the root cause. Just a reminder, this is not just about residential care and that antipsychotics are not just given to residential care. In the US, the best statistics we have is that people living outside of residential care, there are probably two to three times as many people or more getting antipsychotics than there are in residential care. And um, that shows that it's not a nursing home problem, if you will. It is a problem with how we see dementia, how we treat dementia. And um, so if you live at home, if the people who support you have the same stigmas and stereotypes and myths about dementia, if they have a lack of education, or if they have, I might say, the wrong kind of education, if they have a lack of community or financial support to support you, if they are becoming stressed and burned out because of the lack of supports, if they cannot flex their rhythms to meet changing needs, if they become socially isolated, if they have to rely on medications to try to force people into the rhythms that they think they need to care for you, then you can see how your home can be as much of an institution as any care home you visited. It's not bricks and mortar. It is very much a mindset and an inflexible system of providing care. So where do we go with this well-being approach? Well. I love this quote, which I pulled off of the social media somewhere. People who wonder if the glass is half full or half empty are missing the point. The glass is actually refillable. So how can we work in the background to support those domains of well-being for people? Well, if we stop just looking at dementia as problems and looking at people's expressions as problem behaviors and say, you know, none of us has really learned how to give well-being in our professional training, what happens if we start working with people in the background as part of their supportive plan and create a well-being plan and say, how can we give people more security during the day, more autonomy, more meaning, more um, connectedness, relationship throughout the day? And if you believe, as I do, that often that's the root cause of distress, maybe we can keep that from ever happening in the first place, or at least 
help get to root causes better than pills or other uh, interventions might do. Well, I, I, I left practice about 10 years ago, and uh, I've been talking about this for years, and basically because I didn't have my own patient population saying, trust me, this works. Um, that's not particularly scientific, I understand. Um, it's probably why a lot of people haven't jumped on the bandwagon, but fortunately, a few people who are really innovative folks have. And I want to tell you the good side of the story about what happens if you go, in my mind, the right way about this mindset, and then I'll show you what can happen if you go the wrong way. Dr. Angela Norman and um, one of her uh, practice partners, Emily Schneider, um, work in the state of Arkansas. Arkansas has been, over the past decade, a very innovative state in trying to improve uh, aged care, trying to improve care for people living with dementia. and um, Angela, uh, after reading about this well-being framework and some of the ideas, came up to me at a conference three years ago and said, I really want to try this well-being approach that you're talking about because I think it could help the folks I support in long-term care. And uh, so she went away and I didn't hear from her until the following year, but she got back to me about nine months later. And what she had done with her team at the Arkansas Healthcare Foundation was they went to one large provider and asked if he could send her to four communities in his chain that were struggling with antipsychotic use. And she began with her group to teach the staff about enhancing well being through this framework for all those elders proactively and then shifting their systems to support what they needed, what they felt people needed to give them more autonomy, to give them more meaning, whatever. Um, and she wrote back to me to tell me that after six months' time, three out of those four homes had had a relative reduction in their antipsychotics of 61 to 71% and the staff are more satisfied. And they all continue to improve. And as of now, one of them is greater than 90%. Um, so this is, these are numbers. Now we finally got people uh, all over the world who are starting to use non-pharmacologic approaches. They're starting to produce some, some good literature saying this is helpful. But Angela's getting numbers that are far and beyond anything I've ever seen in the literature for other approaches with or without drugs. Um, of course, I asked her, what about the fourth home? They only had an 18% improvement. It's the same provider, same state, same regulators, same resident population. Um, well, what was missing that is the real culture change lesson was leadership was not on board. And I love it when my seminars are attended, not just by the direct support workers, but also leadership. Because unless you are driving these initiatives, unless you are supporting people, uh, enabling them to take the risks they need to take to change systems, to change their view. Uh, no one's going to stick their neck out, and that's exactly what happened in that fourth home. Once they got leadership on board, they began to have similar uh, reductions in their drugs. But Angela and Arkansas didn't stop there. I mentioned Arkansas has been very innovative. They've had a lot of people speak over the years. I've done several seminars with them. And so the regulators came to Angela and said, that looks pretty cool what you did we are going to send you to the 25 highest prescribing homes in the state, the people with the highest antipsychotic use. We want you to take this well-being approach. Well, the last date I've heard from her about that is six months in, those 25 highest prescribers had reduced their antipsychotics by nearly 50% among those homes. But even more than that, and this is the most powerful thing, she has been working with a group of over 100 homes in the state and with the consulting geropsychiatrists to help shift them to a well-being approach. And for those psychiatrists who didn't quite get that, she wrote up a protocol uh, with her team for them and for those consulting homes to look at before transferring people to acute care, to geropsych units or to the emergency room. And in August, those many homes that those 16 psychiatrists were supporting had transferred 20 people to acute geropsych. Um, they put this in place uh, at the beginning of September, and she wrote me while well, I was in Australia last month to tell me that in the month of September that those acute transfers had dropped from 20 people to one person. And in the 100 homes that they are supporting with this approach, where they go in, they teach, they have a hotline for people to call if they get in trouble, um, they have almost eliminated acute transfers for people who they feel are in a crisis or a dangerous situation and can't be cared for in the residential care home. Now, why is this important? Let's talk about what happens when the walls of the building are a little bit off, when we follow the BPSD logic instead of the well-being logic. Um, there is a study that was just started this year in the United States 
the uh, National Institute of Aging in their uh, wisdom, I'm using that in air quotes, as you will see, have started a study to see what it would be like to give electroconvulsive therapy to people who they consider to have severe behaviors, agitation or aggression as they would label them, that um, they are, are not responding to conventional treatment. Um, to me, this is pretty drastic and dangerous therapy to give a person with dementia. There is a certain amount of controversy as to what the lasting side effects are for people with severe depression who have structurally normal brains. There are no good studies about what happens when you give it to somebody whose brain is damaged from dementia, is structurally abnormal, and what kind of lasting problems can it cause, particularly in the memory areas for people that may be struggling with memory already. So this is a pretty drastic measure to be taken. How are they uh, identifying subjects for these studies? Well, these studies are taking place at four big campuses across uh, the country, including the Mayo Clinic, including Harvard, including Emory, uh, right down the road from Kim McRae. And they are bringing subjects in to study by referrals to Jerry Psych units. So they're the, they're the people they are cherry picking to give ECT to. Think about this. Think about this dangerous, potentially dangerous therapy they're giving to people. Think about what would happen if those people had been fortunate enough to live in Arkansas instead of Harvard or Minnesota or Georgia. Those people never would have gotten ECT because they wouldn't have been sent to Jerry Psych because Angela's team would have helped people care for them in the residential care homes and never sent them out. So they never would have been identified as problems. So that is that little difference. That little difference in mindset is keeping people in Arkansas from getting a potentially serious, serious treatment that people in Georgia, Massachusetts, or Minnesota may very well get because they are not getting the well-being approach. That is the big difference in mindset that that subtle distinction can make. So I'm going to stop there. I want to leave lots of time. I'm going to finish up as I often do with a quote from my late great friend Richard Taylor, who said, people talk about person-centered care, but if the view of the person doesn't change, then centering on them actually can make it worse. So thanks a lot. I hope I was able to uh, give that information in a way and at a pace that worked for people, but uh, we're open for comments, questions, differing perspectives. Uh, let's just turn it over to the group.